Hello, 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 and welcome back to Technology Now, a weekly show from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, where we take what's happening in the world and explore how it's changing the way organizations are using technology. We are hosts, Michael Bird and Aubrey Lovell, and today we're taking a bird's eye view of a tech story that's been bubbling for a little while now. It's a rewriting of the book when it comes to our organization's relationship with satellites. We'll be looking at how a decades old industry is being encouraged to modernize, and we'll be asking what it means for unconnected communities and industries in remote areas. Finally, we'll be exploring why it should matter to you and your organizations, whether you're in a big city with great connectivity options or not. So if you're the kind of person who needs to know why what's going on in the world matters to your organization, then this podcast is for you. Oh, and if you haven't yet, do make sure you subscribe on your podcast app of choice so you don't miss out. Right, Aubrey, you ready? Let's get into it. Let's do it. So let's give a backdrop on the satellite industry before today's guest. The first communication satellite was Telstar, which was launched by the U.S. in 1962. Six years later, there are around 7,000 satellites in orbit around Earth. Astonishingly, due to the rise of low-cost, direct-to-consumer satellite networks, that number's gone up by over 2,000 from 2021 alone, according to the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. What a cool place. Other sources give slightly different numbers of active satellites, but the overall trend is the same. Space is seeing a massive growth spurt. And competition is heating up. In November, the UN will be holding its four-yearly auction of radio bandwidth and competition for space on the spectrum, particularly between satellite and cell operators, is likely to be fierce. But I guess the question is, why? And what does this communications boom mean for our organizations and the population as a whole? Well, joining us to explain is Isabel Mauro, Director General of the Global Satellite Operators Association, or GSOA, a body which represents the interests of 70 members in the satellite operations field. So, Isabel, first off, what's causing this huge spike in satellites? Yeah, that's a well, interesting question because in some meetings I've been recently at the UN, the uh, International Telecom Union, the director of ITUR, which is a spectrum, keeps referring to a rebirth of the satellite industry. Uh, you know, the European Space Agency keeps referring to renaissance. So I think you're really online with the sort of feeling that this industry is really going through a, a new phase, if you want. And I think there are two main elements. One is, is really the demand, and the second is innovation. On the demand side, you know, you, we still have significant portions of the world that rely on satellite connectivity that, as they have little to really no ground-based infrastructure to provide terrestrial coverage at all. And I just want to share a few numbers, you know, in the Americas, for example, 22% of the rural population is not covered by any terrestrial mobile signal at all. And you have about an additional 5% only who have access to a 2G network. And in Africa, this figure is up to 29% with 15% without coverage whatsoever. And, and those are, you know, figures from the, the ITU, the International Telecom Union. And then you have also the fact that even in well-connected countries, terrestrial coverage can be spotty in rural and remote areas. And as you know, as we enter IoT, et cetera, this becomes particularly important as well to connect not just people, but connect things as well. And of course, you have all the cases of emergency and disaster relief, sadly, and where you really need, you know, connectivity may be disrupted, terrestrial connectivity. So I think all of those, you know, make that really the demand is really increasing to cover all these areas that are not covered. The second thing as well is, is the innovation and it's not the services that we are seeing. So you now have this multi-orbit dimension where latency, bandwidth, economic security, reliability, availability, all these factors come together, being covered both by GSOs, so, you know, geostationary satellites, the more traditional satellite and what we call the low orbit, the LEO satellite and, and MEO in the in medium orbit, plus, you know, integration of terrestrial and non-terrestrial into 5G and, and later 6G, direct, you know, satellite direct to handset. So a lot of, of innovation that is really also fostering investment, I guess, in the in the industry. Isabel, what opportunities have some operators seen to make operating more satellites a viable option? Well, I think that's what, you know, what I'm saying. I think you will see that um, we see some trends in Europe and elsewhere where 
more traditional operators maybe are looking into more innovative service or the latest services. So we're seeing an emergence of combination of, of, you know, maybe Leo and Geos, of Geos capabilities with high throughput. So really a, a lot of new business models that they are, if you want, trying to see what makes the, the most economic viable sense depending on the regions where they operate, the countries where they operate and, and the different surfaces, because clearly, you know, satellite is not just bound to one, uh, one area. So there is clearly a lot of interest and there is a lot of interest from countries as well, governments, as I was saying, to make sure that uh, the whole population gets covered. And the answer is, is, is a mix of satellite, terrestrial and terrestrial. Why do we need so many satellites to connect everyone? Well, I think because they all have uh, different capabilities and functionality. And so the, the, the first reason, if you ask in terms of number, why is because, first of all, what I was saying, the demand of connecting is really increasing. And terrestrial networks, um, you know, whilst have covered a, a very big part of the population, a lot of the landscape, the, the land mass, if you want, is not covered. And then I think it's really the mix, um, you know, geo uh, satellites can provide broad or narrowband coverage to a wide region at a high capacity. So they can cover, if you want, a large area since they have a broader field of view of the of the surface, of the Earth's surface. For instance, it's very advantageous for broadcasting, for, for example. The non-GSOs, so the, what we call, you know, most of the LEO satellites networks have smaller coverage area per satellite, but can deliver, you know, in some cases, and that's arguable, maybe in some cases latency is better, but they're able to provide coverage to polar regions and, and other regions. It's this combination of, of multi-orbit that we are seeing that is really offering this panacea of you know, services that we couldn't have before. And that in turn has also incentivized more traditional operators, satellite operators, to really look at innovation, innovative services and, and looking at integration, you know, with terrestrial looking at satellite direct-to-device and, uh, and and many other services that we are now seeing emerging or increasing, even if they were there already. How does this tie in with the desire for us all and I guess all of our stuff to be connected? You know, coming together will also help, if you want, the increase of new services such as IoT. So once we have this integration of non-terrestrial and terrestrial, which, you know, without going into details, Free GPP, which is the European Standard Body, had a release 17 where satellite, the satellite component became integrated into the standard, into the mobile standard. So now satellite is really fully part of, if you want, 5G. When you look at 6G, this will be integrated from the very beginning. So it will not be an add-on. It's like, as we are currently looking into 6G, satellite is really being considered as a full add-on. And that, of course, will have, uh, you know, an immense impact on IoT services and, you know, how we are going to integrate and becoming part of 5G. The benefits, when you ask, is that in particular, you are no longer just connecting people that didn't have a handset and couldn't have normal communications. You're going to start connecting businesses, enterprises, government services in areas where they couldn't reach out uh, the, the population or entire communities. So I think it, it really, truly has the potential of transforming IoT by bringing it not only to privileged and you know urban areas, but to remote areas in developed economies and areas that were totally uncovered in, you know, least developed economies in parts of the world. So there's a huge UN conference coming up soon. Could you tell us a little bit about that and why it matters? Yeah, so the, it's called the, you know, WRC, World Radio Conference. From uh, It's hosted by uh, the UN, uh, International Telecom Union. It happens every four years, and that's where all decisions related to spectrum, uh, which, you know, as you know, is the oxygen of any tech company, any any telecom sector, satellite, mobile, fixed, you know, whatever you call it. So this is happening every four years. It's happening in November in Dubai, just before COP28. And for us, it's a really crucial uh, moment in time because it determines, you know, not only the satellite that we can keep as an industry, which is vital for so many of our services, but also potential new, um, you know, bands of spectrum that we will need for more innovative services that I was describing that are coming through for the higher throughput that we are delivering on so many of the capabilities, but also, you know, IoT, there is an increasing demand as well. And, and you know, we were asking at the very beginning to be connected all the time. People expect to be connected now on planes, on cruises when you are on so air, sea, not only land, but on air and at sea. And that as well is increasing the capacity that we need 
and the areas to be covered. And therefore, for us, it's really critical as well that we, we, we have more spectrum, you know, for the years to come. So finally, Isabel, why should the rest of our organisations care about the satellite industry? Because I think it's really a way of, of, you know, looking forward of how critical this industry is going to, A, fill some gaps where there are gaps in connectivity. Again, as I said, you know, in terms of geographical space, uh, but also communities that are not connected. It's going to be an incredible source of innovation when you think at, as well at uh, 5G, IoT and, and new services direct to device, you know, satellite direct to device. So being able as well to roam seamlessly between a mobile connection and a satellite connection without even knowing terrestrial, non-terrestrial, Wi-Fi, whatever it is that connect us. I think that's why you should care about satellite because that's what is going to enable that seamlessly, you know, ubiquitous kind of connection. And, you know, if you really truly want to connect uh, everywhere, you know, everyone, everywhere, anytime, that will have to be done by by satellite. So I think that's why why we should care. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Isabel. And we will be back with Isabel in a moment. So do not go anywhere. All right, it's time for Today I Learned, the part of the show where we take a look at something happening in the world we think you should know about. And uh, this week, I've got one for you, Aubrey. Ooh. So we're going back to last week's theme of clean shipping. Now, cutting up and recycling old ships can be one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. They're full of toxic chemicals and are often broken up on beaches where their chemicals can spill into the sea. And in almost all cases, the work is done by hand. According to the UN's International Labour Organization, 90% of shipbreaking in the world is carried out in Bangladesh, China, India, Pakistan, and Turkey. Often, many of the dangerous materials on board, including mercury and asbestos, are sold off in the local community, causing significant health and environmental risks. We've linked that report in the podcast description. Now, a team in Germany have developed a shipbreaking robot which uses water cutters to do the job more cleanly and in a fraction of the time. The powerful robotic arms work in teams, each tackling a part of the ship so it comes apart in the safest way possible whilst the chemicals on board are collected. They're working on building huge 3D scanners and the next step in their process will be to create almost a 3D unprinter designed to use AI to calculate the fastest way to pull apart a ship. Now, it's hoped the technology could make one of the most dangerous and polluting jobs in the world far cleaner, far safer, and far more efficient, whilst also meaning much, much more material can be recycled. Thanks for that, Michael. Interesting stuff. All right, it's time for questions from the audience. You've been sending in your questions to Isabel Marrow on satellite operations, and we've pulled out a couple. The first question comes from Seb in El Paso. When it comes to connecting the less well-provisioned parts of the world, what does this boom mean? If you look at where cellular connectivity or terrestrial connectivity hasn't hasn't made its way, it's, you know, in most cases, and I think the mobile operators will be the first ones to say that, it's because it is not economically viable uh, for them in in some regions, in some parts of the world. This, again, leads to looking at solution, which governments in particular are very keen for us as industries to come together, mobile and satellite. Uh, we are seeing an emergence of you know, partnerships between mobile operators and satellite operators. In fact, at Mobile World Congress earlier this year in February, I think I'd never seen so much satellite presence, you know, in terms of stands from, you know, different satellite operators, from vendors. So I think there is definitely this trend happening. So the second question comes from Paula in Dubai, who would like to know if we can put a number on how many people are currently unconnected and how far you think that number is going to change in the next few years as costs come down and connectivity improves. I think it's dramatically going to come down. You know, we have, uh, if you look at figures, I think pre-COVID, we were at 3.2, I think, billion people that were not connected. And, you know, today we are at 2.6. That's the latest stats from uh, the ITU, you know, at the announced at the Broadband Commission at the, during the UNGA week uh, in September. So I think that increase that we saw during COVID was really incredible in terms of bridging the digital divide, bridging the digital gap and connecting, you know, bringing online many more hundreds of million of people. The main thing is I hope that governments keep that momentum because, uh, you know, connectivity became the oxygen for every society, every economy around the world. Uh, and there are many more problems. There is inflation, there are wars going on, and we tend to forget 
that connectivity still remains critical. And I, I do hope that that remains a very big on the agenda, top priority on the agenda of every government uh, so that we, we all work together to really bring the cost down, uh, reach economies of scales. Uh, we have collaborations between different industries and hopefully, you know, can reach everywhere and provide, you know, internet or connectivity to everyone around the world. Thanks so much, Isabel. It's been great to talk. And you can find more information on the topics discussed on today's episode in the show notes. All right. Well, we're getting towards the end of the show, which means it's time for This Week in this History. Week in history. A look at monumental events in the world of business and technology, which has changed our lives. Now, the clue last week was it's 1938 and the Martians aren't coming. Do you know what it is? I had a bit of an inkling. It was Orson Welles' broadcast of War of the Worlds on national radio in the US this week in 1938, wow. which featured a news report of alien invasion so realistic it reportedly caused national panic as people who tuned in partway through the show thought that we were really under attack. The piece started playing at 8 p.m. on October the 30th, and within half an hour, police and station execs burst in to try and stop the performance. Eventually, the police carried off all the scripts and recordings, and Wells was forced to escape through a back entrance as hundreds of reporters crowded the street outside the studio. But hey, as they say, there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? I guess that's right. You know, sidebar, I actually studied this in school, this particular event, and around the psychological events of them doing this and what it did to people. So it's really, really fascinating, interesting, and also kind of sad. But anyways, we're going to move right on to the next clue, which is 1895. And you'll see straight through this one, not such a tricky one this time. Oh, I'm not sure that's not tricky. I don't think I'd 1895. know 1895, I don't know. I straight through this one. I guess we'll find out next week. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of Technology Now for this week. Thank you so much to our guest, Isabel Mauro, Director General of the Global Satellite Operators Association. And to our listeners, thank you all so much for tuning in. Technology Now is hosted by Michael Bird and myself, Aubrey Lovell. This episode was produced by Sam Dada-Pollen and Zoe Anderson with production support from Harry Morton, Alicia Kempson, Allison Paisley, Alyssa Mitri, Camilla Patel, Alex Podmore, and Chloe Sewell. Our social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman, Katie Guarino, and our social media designers are Alejandra Garcia, Carlos Alberto Suarez, and Ambar Maldonado. Technology Now is a Lower Street production for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We'll see you next week.